Good evening, everyone. Please, can you welcome Harris Sambalukas, who shot this wonderful movie. Uh, also, before we start, I'd, I'd just like to congratulate Harris, who became a father last week when his, his wife gave, gave birth to his first baby. Uh, Eva, I think, is the name of it. Eva. Baby Eva? Yes, Baby Eva. <laughs> um, well, um, congratulations, Harris. What a beautiful looking film, beautiful lighting. Um, they're both romantic and funny. Uh, and I think it's wonderful that Disney chose to make this movie in England with a British director and cinematographer, um, British full, complete British cast. Pretty much. Um, and um, I'm sure it's a quintessential fairy, fairy tale, really, Cinderella. And you must have felt very honoured when you were asked to uh, to be a cinematographer. Daunted, more than Daunted. <laughs> yeah, and I suppose you felt sort of quite a responsibility as well, being given yeah. the task of. That's the. In a way, that's a, you. You kind of have to remember that um, it's got to last a certain amount of time, and that people have certain preconceptions about uh, the fairy tale, yeah. and they have certain preconceptions going into. Um, I think something that they've known and watched as an animation for so many years. Um, it's probably 1953 that the original animation um, came out. And, and has there never been a... a no, there was... Uh, Mary Pickford did uh, a Cinderella in 1915. And mm -hmm. I think the Melier brothers uh, made a, a Cinderella. And then everything else has been uh, kind of modern, completely modern mm -hmm. kind of bits of the story in a modern way, but the kind of uh, Charles Perrault version of it mm. um, has been the Melier brothers, Mary Pickford, and then uh, Walt's version uh, in 1953. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, you, you did the movie with your um, um, your long-term collaborator, Ken Branagh. You've shot, uh, was it five movies? Four, this five is movies? the fourth one. Fourth movie. Yeah. So that must have been great because having such a good relationship, um, obviously you must have a shorthand on set and must really help in the preparation. Yeah, uh, he, Ken was actually, uh, well, I was expecting to shoot uh, the Scottish play with him <laughs> and then uh, someone else did it before us. So um, he decided to do Cinderella instead. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the way life goes. <laughs> Um, I suppose you could say that the, the, the film has a very classic look to it. And, um, I mean, how did you decide on the look? Because obviously there were various ways you could have gone with it. You could have given it a modern, modern feel, and, um, but you went for that classic look. Uh, how did you uh, get, come across, get to that decision? I mean, well, that was first meeting with Ken and David Barron. It was pretty much about, um, mm. we're going to embark on this, and uh, we really want to make a classic uh, tale. I think we've all been kind of enchanted by cinema of kind of yesterday and um, that there's a certain magic in that and that the, we all were very aware of, I think the limitations that filmmakers had uh, early on mm. and that some of those limitations in terms of um, lighting and film stock and, and kind of camera use um, actually opened you up and made you think a certain way and frame a certain way and light a certain way. Um, so straight off the bat, we mm. wanted to shoot something that was kind of classical and um, uh, where uh, we just kind of enjoyed making a film like that. I think mm. that's important, like mm. not trying to do uh, a modern interpretation of this. Mm. Uh, I think we just wanted to relish it, really. Um, and, and otherwise, you're stuck. Yeah. You know, and, and you see that in a lot of modern um, uh, fantasy films, modern um, contemporary kind of uh, children's stories, that mm -hmm. they don't have what I think a legacy of a Disney film might have been, which is a real love of art, a real kind of um, uh, innocence in it all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was going to, we said we were going to be playful, joyful, and, and we were going to kind of um, play with this. Uh, when we started looking at painters, we, 
we said, you know, you, there's a lot of, there's a million period pieces and they mm -hmm. all reference the great Flemish artists, etc. We went straight for Fragonard and kind of um, slightly more, uh, again, joyful um, mm. painters. Um, yeah, certainly very colourful as well, yeah. isn't it? Those beautiful yeah. colour palettes. You know, when you've got Sandy and Dante doing yeah. kind of design as well, um, they bring a lot to it. Um, uh, they'd done a lot of research. They'd done, you know, they wanted to make everything. Mm. Um, yeah, the costumes are amazing. Yeah. Uh, and we wanted to kind of embrace that and, and see what we could do with that. Um, uh, so uh, Ken had a very, very specific way of blocking this straight mm -hmm. on. You know, that uh, he had worked with Rob Ashford, the choreographer, uh, before, and um, he really wanted to choreograph everything. I mean, he's done this on other films, you just don't notice it. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, he cast Brashnikov in um, uh, Jack Ryan and did a scene with him and said, we're going to do a really long tracking shot because I want to see how this dancer walks. Mm. Um, and it's a really simple thing, but, um, uh, and it's really subtle, but he adds those bits to, to everything. Mm. And I think the, kind of, he expects the camera to work with that. Yeah, yeah. And how much um, influence was there from Disney? Did they try and push you in a certain direction? Um, they must have had ideas of how they wanted it to look as well. They did, but I think we did about 15 or more days of testing uh, before we shot. So it was pretty exact. Yeah. By the end of it, you, you can talk about things, but then when you send kind of uh, film and pictures, um, mm. they kind of know. Mm. They were happy in the mm. direction it was going. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I never actually felt any um, backlash from them. And at the same time, I wasn't trying to do... Um, you know, a dark, gritty, uh, handheld film. You know, yeah. this. I didn't show no. them the kind of born identity as a no, reference, no. so no. they weren't that. <laughs> they weren't yeah. too scared. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I see you had your regular gaffer on this, yes. which must have been a great, great camera because some big, big lots sets of regular, light. yeah, yeah, and your regular crew. Uh, um, yes, Jules has been with me for ages, and not mm. just Jules, I mean, uh, Dan Lowe, um, mm. uh, Ricky Stelling, our rigger, I mean, mm. there were uh, electricians like uh, Matt Wilson, they've been on for, um, since 2000, I would yeah. imagine, um, on our crew. And what we, what we have done over the years, kind of, is develop a, a system of lighting, and a system of lighting that works for Ken yeah. as well. Um, which uh, includes large, soft tungsten units um, that are all kind of DMX, that goes as a standard. But on top of all of that, there are a lot of electric hoists, which I mm -hmm. think is not so common. Um, um, and that idea of being able to continuous, kind of continuously um, light and tweak while yeah. rehearsals are going, but really silently. Yeah. The idea of a really silent um, uh, set mm. that's constantly working, but no one's on top of each other, mm. and, and um, everyone can keep perfecting, um, I think is crucial. So a lot of the things we did were, were not just the look mm. of what we wanted to do, but mm. the, the way we wanted to, yeah. to work. Yeah, yeah, for efficiency. And I, you're saying that you, you, you got your gaffer to source some older yeah. Units, sort of bug eyed 10Ks and the like, to give, give it that sort of period feel. Yes, I think we were exclusively tungsten and large mm. sources. I mean, we kind of went for, we did some tests with 65mm and we really wanted to shoot at 65mm, but sending, to, sending film to a photo cam um, every, every evening was mm -hmm. not going to go anywhere. Um, so the good thing about actually shooting the test is we could then do comparative tests in mm. 35 and see what we we thought would be the closest. And um, we tried 50 ASA for exteriors and 200 ASA um, Kodak for uh, interiors and uh, night exteriors. Mm -hmm. And we tried a whole bunch of anamorphic lenses. And I don't, I've only shot Primo anamorphics on Sleuth. Um, mm -hmm. and kind of remember the crispness I got out of it and how they really stand out. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they have a very particular look. And there was a remark, it's not the same as 65, but it's the closest we got. Mm -hmm. And at least we had a, a kind of benchmark mm -hmm. um, 
uh, to kind of go by. Yeah. Uh, so that informed a lot. I mean, the minute you're 200 ASA and you're at a T4, um, you know, you, you're not going to be lighting with candles or a, a little LED stick. No, it's quite a um, lot of light on the yeah. ballroom set, I imagine. <laughs> um, it's been quite warm, is it? And you can't use your eyes. You kind of have to imagine yeah. it, uh, yeah. light it, and then yeah. wait for dailies to come back. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't just use candlelight. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, was it ever, I mean, there was no, that's 35mm Panavision anamorphic is your preferred choice always. It was yeah. never any question of shooting it digitally. It didn't, that didn't come from any, any direction, did it? No, um, Disney did, well, there were two little things. Disney did ask me to sh see a test that they shot in Los Angeles mm -hmm. with various digital formats. Um, I looked at it, told them it looks like shit, and I don't really want to work like this. And, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. That was the end of the story. The um, of um, I did go to the screening, though. Mm. Um, I mean, they basically, their idea of a test was to put, I mean, it wasn't shit. It was just, it was a really shit test, definitely. <laughs> um, they put five cameras on a car at night in downtown Los Angeles, drove around a block at night, yeah. and said, um, this is how you evaluate the camera system. Um, and I thought, well, that doesn't really include faces, costumes. Um, uh, so it, if they were trying to win um, with that uh, mm. uh, argument, I, it really mm. wasn't going to be um, uh, a very... Yeah. And, and we wanted an old-fashioned look, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is an old-fashioned look. It you know? is, yeah. I think film can be contemporary, but um, you, you choose film because you want mm. certain... You know, you want mm. a certain look. Um, yeah, well, those anamorphic uh, lens levels, that, that'd be round or something. Did you use any filtration? Did you find you needed to use just a little bit on the Teeny bit. Women, yeah. Teeny bit on the women, but although mainly what we do is we'd switch to slightly, we, we had a set of C series as well. So yeah. um, if I wanted to go a little softer, um, I'd use C series um, and um, a teeny bit, about an eighth to a quarter. Uh, uh, Classic soft, mm -hmm. predominantly on um, candle scenes. Yeah. I just like uh, not a lot, but just a very small amount of uh, uh, glow around candles yeah. and the chandeliers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but predominantly, I use Atmos for uh, softening. Softening. I'd rather kind of work with the uh, special effects team and and really get uh, a nicely balanced haze. Mm. Um, that we've tested and gone through mm. and kind of... So there was haze in everything yeah. um, in the film. Oh, um, so, yeah. it's, so it's not always noticeable, really. Yeah, well, we kept it at, yeah. like, just noticeable. Mm. Um, I think I did a bit too much on Jack Ryan, and both Ken and, and the producers were a little, like, just on this one, can you ease off a little on yeah. the smoke? And, and we did some tests, and we said, mm -hmm. okay, you know, it really is a level, it's a, it's a taste level. I like mm. a teeny bit more. Um, mm. uh, and they like a teeny bit less. So mm. uh, we got to a place where we thought that was correct mm. and, and we kept it there. Mm. Yeah, the tricky thing is just getting the consistency, generally, yeah. isn't it? I mean, weirdly, you could have a whole conversation on smoke. And, mm. and if, you, if you talk to a good um, uh, special effects uh, uh, team, they do make their own haze. And, mm. and they do, they, they can kind of, get a chemical balance that's yeah. uh, softer, lasts longer, et cetera. Mm. Um, mm. There's an art and a science to that as well. Mm. Mm. Um, so you had some film dailies on this, I gather, yes. just to keep an eye on the quality. I think you have to. Yeah. On, if you're shooting film, you have to look at your, your negative yeah. printed. Yeah. Um, what we couldn't do is do select dailies, which I think has stopped ages ago since DIs. Mm. Um, so uh, what you could do, what I could do, is select uh, a, a reel of film, and sometimes I wouldn't select mm. the uh, select take because at the end of the day it was just me and the camera team watching it. Mm. Um, I would do a select. Re I mean, Spooky would kind of figure out with me what we were going to kind of. Mm -hmm. in terms of what might have the biggest variety of shots. Yeah. So if I had a reel that had a close-up and a wide shot um, and another scene, I'd pick that reel to print rather than, um, you know, 3,000 feet of the same take over and over again. It would, mm. you know, you, 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 we were smart yeah. about that. And yeah. also we knew that it, you know, 
to get that privilege of watching film dailies, you can't abuse it either. So mm. um, we just made sure we were we were careful. Mm. And you were still able to get your, your prints made in yes. this country. Um, we were in that transitional period. So I dailies uh, processed our negative. Deluxe stopped processing and, and Technicolor mm. uh, by that point. Um, so, but our prints were made by Clive Noakes at uh, Deluxe, which I was very grateful for because mm. um, that meant that um, Clive could always check, kind of on a daily basis. Um, you know, we'd get him checking a mm. bit of film. Yeah. Um, yeah. That made a difference. That was a reassuring. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we ever ran into a problem, we'd print it straight away. Yeah. Um, I've, I've heard you say that one of Ken's great strengths is his, his blocking and staging and staging the action within the drama so that the performance is, is always key. And um, um, obviously that doesn't always make it easy, easy for you. Mm. Could you just sort of like elaborate on that? Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. And I, and I think, I don't know how, how it looks to an audience, but um, sometimes the most simple things are the most difficult things to shoot. Um, where the prince and Cinderella meet, um, he said, we're categorically shooting this with all of them on horseback. And I'm like, okay, because uh, you have to admit, um, if someone wanted the easy way out, um, you get some stunt doubles, they run through a forest, they do all of that, they get to a really nice place, they stop, they get off the horse, um, they look at each other, blah, 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 and then they get back on the horse, doubles get on them, and they ride off. Ken actually has the actors learn how to ride horseback, gets Lily to learn how to ride horseback bareback. Yeah. yeah, double, make it, you know, she's never been on a horse before in her life and she's galloping doing, you know, you, you can, can tell in the, in the show though that um, she's galloping to a stop yeah. bareback and then starting dialogue. Um, and then he, he gets the um, stuntman and, the, and Steve Dent, the uh, horse uh, 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 wrangler coordinator, um, to choreograph a sequence for the horses to do while the dialogue's going on, while well, we've got to shoot an exterior daylight scene over uh, seven days, days, keep it consistent, consistent and, and work with uh, two cranes and a third camera. camera. Um, and that's how you get that scene in, the, you know, it's, it, it's not the easy way out, let's no. put it that way. Um, no. And there's a lot of this. Uh, and a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. um, and some really, you know, uh, great operating. Luke's yeah. here, Roger's here, Hamish is here, you know. Um, Malcolm was on the, on the cranes. I mean, that's how it all happens. Um, yeah. There's no marks for the focus pullers. No. You can't do, at one point, he, we didn't do very long lenses, but at one point he did ask, uh, I think one of the few places we went mm. long lens on mm. a crane, on horseback, mm. um, on a dialogue scene. Um, you know, it, it looks great up there, but it's a, it's a huge challenge. Yeah. And, and you've got to enjoy it, I think. Um, and that's what we were, trying to, we were talking mm. about earlier on yeah. today. Yeah. You can't go in there going, um, I wish they just stood still. No. Uh, or <laughs> uh, you've just got to embrace it and say, that's, that's what's going to make this interesting and exciting. Mm. Well, it was amazing, amazingly consistent if that was over seven days with yeah. the light. So you must be reasonably lucky with we were light, were you, but we shot only, thankfully, in um, a, on a sunny day. Yeah. Uh, we didn't use any lighting. We only used bounce, and we used silver limes. So that's why it feels a bit more golden even. Oh, yeah. We could go. I wanted it to be. I don't like lighting uh, exteriors, no, uh, daytime so exteriors, yeah. but I do like using uh, grip gear um, for it, bounce and um, and flagging it. Mm. But to make it slightly unrealistic and a slightly more magical. Um, really old-fashioned silver lame, silver mm -hmm. gold lame, which mm -hmm. is maybe a bit kitsch for uh, modern filmmaking, but um, kind of worked uh, on this. And if it felt too goldeny, we'd just uh, throw a cheesecloth muslin over it just to mm -hmm. take it down a bit. And you got away without using any lighting on that, did you? you on that scene, yes. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, well, quite often the exteriors are more difficult than the interiors, aren't yeah. they? Because you can't control them. You towards the end of the shoot, that was in September, um, towards the end of the shoot in December, mm. where you see all the exterior s scenes outside the house, for example, when the prince fight and, and, and the captain that's played by Nonzo 
uh, find Cinderella and come, come back for the shoe uh, mm. trial. You can tell the it's getting darker. Mm. It, you know, you, we'd shoot in between rain. Mm. Um, it, it got a bit more tricky. But September in England, I've done a, quite a few exterior sequences. This is the balloon sequence in Enduring Love. Um, a couple of scenes here. Um, uh, they. They are the most consistent. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is something about um, England in September that's really photogenic. Mm. Um, but you've got to have your wits about you with mm. it. And you can't miss a moment, I think. Yeah. So if you've got two cranes mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a dolly, and you've enclosed everything in um, reflectors, mm. and the actors are on mm. horseback, um, and there's no mask, mm. <laughs> you better have a good crew, <laughs> um, because you can't miss. The next, the next, in half an hour, it could be pouring down with rain. Mm. Um, yeah. So there's those things to kind of mm. uh, <laughs> counterbalance as well. Um, well, that's probably enough for, for me now. I wonder whether are there are any questions from, from the audience who would like to ask Hans a question. Were you left to your own devices during the break? Um, Yes, yes. Um, I, I think, think the grading process, process again with uh, uh, Ken and David has, has been something over a few films now. Um, I don't like the idea that you grade at the end of the film. I think grading starts at, in prep. So um, we started grading our tests and we were very uh, aware and uh, consistent with our dailies. And there's another thing I well, which I think might be a little bit unusual, um, which is uh, I actually grade the preview grades in HD. Um, and they may not be. Thank you, Audrey. Um, I think if I'm given an opportunity to grade, whether it's in HD or in 2K, I'm going to take it. Um, and m more of that is to uh, get the production and the director aware of where a film is going. Um, and I do a system that's similar to the way I graded when it was photochemical. So you do your first answer print. I, I do a first pass that's really rough. You know, I only get two days for a, a, a preview. And we just bash through everything. But we get it to a certain place. And on the second preview uh, grade, we take notes from Ken. Um, we talk about it. I give notes. Um, so I had, I just didn't waste. Um, uh, uh, an opportunity in a way to uh, uh, grade and show it. And then when you get to a 2K, you do have to do it all over again. But at least you're going off um, uh, something that's already there. So I didn't get to do the whole grade on this because I was in South Africa on Eye in the Sky. But prior to the actual grade, I'd done 20 days grading, which is a lot. Mm. Um, so um, I went back at the end and did some work. But um, we were all on the same page. Mm. Yeah, it must be interesting to revisit it so many days later. It's quite often in grading what you do at the beginning of the week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that's the mistake, you end up with? which I've done many times yeah. at the beginning of DIs, is yeah. you go in and you work for three days on one reel, um, and you're getting everything perfect. And then, and then people see it, and they're like, oh, god, no, this isn't right. And you, yeah. you go back. Um, so the idea of doing it in layers over and over and over again and just revisiting and perfecting is more reminiscent to film um, uh, uh, printing. Yeah. And I think there are huge merits. And I love shooting on digital as well. But I still won't ever change kind of the way I learn, which is photochemically. And, mm. I, and, I, and I, think, I think it shows. You can, I think a good film is one where certain steps that you've learned um, have been consistent throughout, no matter whether no matter whether it's a photochemical print or a DI. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, what lenses do you use and uh, why? Uh, I used uh, Panavision Primo Anamorphics um, and some C series lenses and the odd G series. Thank you, Charlie Todman and Hugh Whitaker, um, for a very specific reason. Um, the as I said earlier, the Primos were for a very clear uh, 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 picture. The C-series were for more portraiture work. And the G-series were that some of the aberrations that you get in C-series, which I love, um, 
weren't going to work in the um, ballroom, we did a lot of full figure shots. That we, we saved the close-ups for very specific moments. And um, there's a lot of master shots that become mid shots that, and especially in the wide shots with feet, some of the aberrations in the C-series um, gave you out of focus feet. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's where the kind of the odd G series um, was light enough to use in steady cam, um, and yet uh, 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 had, had less aberrations. Um, and I love those aberrations, it's just they weren't appropriate in, in this scenario. Was uh, sort of technical like three strip, like a reference, kind of reference? It felt like a, you were kind of, kind of mirror, some of that kind of. We were definitely going for that, um, and they were, it was definitely in the costume and the and the art direction and in the exposure. Um, I mean, generally, if I want a slightly softer look, um, I underexpose, and if I want a, a, a punchier colours, I um, I overexpose. I mean, a third was the minimum; it was usually two thirds over, um, and then you can really crunch the the, the colours. Um, there wasn't much. I mean, I, I wouldn't say we went more than 10% saturation in, in the DI. So what you're seeing is kind of uh, 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 colors on set. Mm -hmm. And I think tungsten brings out all the color, whereas uh, tungsten and daylight will always bring out more color than um, HMI or LEDs mm -hmm. or um, any fluorescence. Um, you get a wider gamma. Yeah. Since you couldn't um, light off the floor in the, in the ballroom, how did you just approach the, the overall? Well, um, it's, they were big soft boxes uh, made with park hands um, that were on electric hoists with muslin in front. They were all soccer packs back to a dimmer board and given a kind of uh, a flicker effect. And generally, one of the things I really like to do uh, on anamorphic on a wide set is basically get the lamps just an inch out of frame. Um, and uh, that they can come lower and closer as you, you, get, you get tighter. Um, the problem with doing something like that is your shot is constantly involving in a, in a rehearsal just to the last minute. So literally, Jules would be next to me with um, our uh, winch operators. And, and literally, it was all the cameras had all eyes on lights, and, and we just tweaked everything with it. I mean, literally an inch. Um, Did you supplement it with anything on a boom pole or like a mud pole? We tried that. It, within Cor and I tried that on Mamma Mia. It never, ever worked. Um, not with choreography. Um, camera was spinning everywhere. There were three cameras at all times. Um, I just want, I need to keep working till pretty much action. And I need to be able to be working silently um, uh, to do that. And also, those giant soft boxes are the, kind of the equivalent of having a light right here. But you've pretty much, I mean, it went wall to wall uh, on the entire perimeter. Um, but it's a lot of light. But it uh. seemed like you controlled this film nicely, so it's sort of at the center. It was a nice way it tailed off from the audience, and it was on the dance. Well, another, the, the other thing I did, which is, again, f something I tried on Thor, is I had um, production design uh, make gaps in the floor for every wall along the entire perimeter and put park hands that I think we ended up being about 1,200 park hands along the entire floor around, and the same above so that I can get one exposure for the walls and it's not this, it, it doesn't rely on the, on the lighting I do on the actors. So all those up and down lights would have a chase and a flicker on them so that um, basically I had a consistent exposure on the wall and then um, I used the soft boxes not to light the space but only to light the actors. And I, I find you can actually then um, be really consistent shot to shot and also be really consistent as you do a 360 shot, because again, that's the problem with putting a softbox. Um, you know, I, I generally side light with a bit of, they also work as fill from the front, but then you do these spinning shots and it's backlit, but the walls all look the same, for example. Um, 
It, that was the difficult, like, that's when production had me in the naughty room um, uh, for a few weeks. But um, <laughs> um, uh, that was the reason for doing it that way. How much of the um, pre-beers and the digital work have you been constructed? Some of those huge exteriors were presumably um, all constructed in the computer for you. Were they there? Um, Nick, there was very little actually on this. We did do some previous. We predominantly worked on off um, hand drawn um, uh, storyboards, and we storyboarded certain bits, but much less than we have in the past with Ken. Um, I'm used to doing a lot of previs and um, and storyboarding, and this was kept to quite a minimum in a way. Um, certain shots certainly were. Um, what we had worked on with, with Charlie, our uh, VFX supervisor, um, was how far we could go. A lot of those sets were built. I mean, Dante, actually, if he had his way, we would not do a single green screen. And all those um, house shots are scenic backings. So we didn't have green screen around the windows. Um, those are scenic backings, um, hand-painted um, perspective drawings. Um, when Ella arrives at the fountain, that fountain, the staircase, everything's built. It's behind the staircase that's, uh, that's uh, uh, constructed. And really, very minimal green screen, because by that point, it's really far away. Uh, we also did a mixture of the same set as exteriors in uh, Black Park and interiors. So greens would reconstruct them. It, it, we ended up getting to a pretty bad weather situation by December, and a very difficult situation for actors to work under. So um, we kind of just transplanted whole sets um, on massive interior uh, uh, sets, which were cost effective in that they were um, um, uh, greens, and they were on sets that already had our soft boxes in our whole um, lighting system in place. So we angled everything to match what we were doing um, with uh, cherry pickers and the exteriors. And I know it sounds a little uh, crazy way of doing things, but we did run into bad weather, really bad weather. Um, but uh, the, the scene that really was prevised and, and worked off a previs, I would say, is the carriage sequence. Um, that's the one, that, that transformation carriage sequence. And even if you, because a lot of the stuff is one shot, for example, Ella's dress transformation is a single shot. Um, they did do previs, but it really was, it was a shoot over, it was one shot on one day, one shot on another day on an exterior, and then one shot with motion control. But the previs is, is almost, well, it's one shot. <laughs> um, so, uh, we decided that we were going to work with the choreography that Ken had and that VFX would work on that afterwards. And then um, we knew it was roughly like this, but we didn't actually nail it down to, um, you know, how many spins Ella does and things like that. So all that was second unit, was it, the carriage? The, a lot of the carriage was second unit and VFX unit. Yeah. Um, because the mice are not real. Yeah. <laughs> All the horses. Ella's real. <laughs> I think the CGI work, on, what they did to Blenheim Palace was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Really. And, and even the carriage, I think that we had various versions of the carriage with a, a shorter wheel and a taller wheel, so it does do... So it, it was a mix of um, uh, VFX and, and uh, uh, some great second unit stunt uh, uh, yeah. photography. Yeah. Jake? So, kind of having, having made the decisions you made in shooting this film, if you were going to make it again, is there anything you'd do differently? Uh, uh, no, I'd, I'd shoot it on film, um, for sure. Uh, I don't think, you'd, it, I wouldn't want to shoot it digitally, no way. Um, yeah, I'd 
want to do the whole thing all over again, Jake. I mean, you're never satisfied. Um, um, I see a lot of mistakes. Um, particular, like my, my least favorite scenes are the ones um, towards the end around about the shoe trials. Um, I just cringe. Um, uh, it just doesn't have, it's a little over cooked and a little over lit. Mm -hmm. um, I so. And, and it, they really bug me. I think um, I'd pay a bit more attention there. And, and we were chasing our tail at the end of a schedule and in, in December on exteriors. Um, um, that's the, I think, and I, I was tired. <laughs> uh, and maybe too quiet. Um, uh, uh, I'd say that those are the things I change. <laughs> Was a, it was a 10K bug eye about <laughs> the size of the moon. Um, <laughs> um, we didn't really need to use eye lights because I did a lot of front lighting. So it was within the, the kind of portraiture. Um, we, we, we got a whole bunch of old school lights that uh, Warner's shipped in for us, some from the States. Uh, um, I've always loved bug eyes. Basically, um, it's not the light source that creates the kind of aesthetics or the characteristics of a lamp, I find. Um, like with cameras, it's usually the lens. Um, and some of these older lenses, um, I think Mole Richardson made some fantastic lighting lenses. And what we wanted to do is source some of those and then uh, make sure that they had their original vintage glass in them. Um, and we changed bulbs. Um, but um, the, I used to call it a bug eye, um, but I'm, I'm, I've been told it's a big eye. Uh, <laughs> I prefer bug eye. Um, but we used decapods, which is a really great invention from the kind of late uh, 80s, early 90s, um, of battens of um, uh, MR16s, where they've scientifically calculated the distance that if that there's a single uh, shadow from them. And they're, they're just not used very much. Mel Richardson bought the patent, and I don't think they've built any more, but they had a whole bunch of them that they shipped over for us. And you can actually attach them. Um, so you could have one strip, or you can have five in a, in a row. And um, not too dissimilar from a, a Wendy light, for example, but in a much smaller, more usable um, uh, unit. And we could only get a few of those. Um, so we used them where we could. Um, and we just build chicken wire around them and muslin. Um, but that was our equivalent of a fluorescent. Um, it's just about 10 times stronger. Um, and it's, and it's, uh, it's a halogen. Uh, but those eye lights were predominantly 10K uh, bug eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the lighting on Kate Blanchett. Did you have something special for her? She um, Yes, and she did have certain requirements. She wanted to look a certain way. I think she was slightly jealous of uh, Lily. Uh, <laughs> um, and, um, and I think Ken's idea that she's seductive rather than evil was a really great choice. So um, I've always loved um, uh, kind of Joe Walker's films. I, I think his, his photography is fantastic. Um, and when I was really young and a student, I read his book, The Light on Her Face, which totally inspired me. Um, just as a human being, as, as, uh, I love his lighting. I know that Harrell um, copied his lighting in that great photography of his. It wasn't the other way around. Um, and um, so we wanted to uh, uh, kind of work to some of those levels of lighting on her and make her more of a kind of film noir character. And that that would juxtapose quite nicely with uh, the kind of softer effect that we were doing on Lily. Um, uh, and because we weren't going, I think, for a, a kind of painterly effect in terms of 
Flemish candlelight or anything like that. It really was kind of this over-the-top Rococo thing. Um, you could throw in um, that kind of lighting. Um, I mean, it doesn't match, but um, it kind of wasn't the point to match. OK, well, thanks very much, everyone. I think perhaps we should call it an evening there. And I just want to say, looks looks wonderful, Harris, and you must be very proud of it, of your work, and wish you every success with it. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming.